And welcome back to the show, everyone. My name is Brian Elam. I will be your host here on this episode of the Be Successful series on Get Your Entrepreneurship Together. And today, we have a very special guest. John Horn is with us of Stub Group. And what they do is they are advertising specialists, specifically in the digital advertising space, we're talking Google, we're talking Meta. So if you are thinking about dipping your toe into that world, getting into advertising dollars, or if you're already doing it, but maybe not seeing quite the success in your campaigns that you might like, this is going to be an episode you're going to want to pay attention to. Make sure you save it, write some notes, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of nuggets in here for you to help level your business and level up those ads. So without further ado, John, thank you so much for coming on, man. I'm excited for this conversation. Brian, good to see you. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. My pleasure. So before we get into the weeds of tactics and tips and all of those things that we're going to talk about, I really like people to understand who they're listening to and understand their story. So we can kind of lay the foundation of this whole conversation. So with that being said, where did you grow up and how did you get started in this whole entrepreneurship world? Yeah. So my growing up was bifurcated on two different parts of the country. So born, started growing up in New Jersey. Uh, my family had been in New Jersey for many, many years. And then around, I think when I was 10, uh, we picked up and moved cross country to Texas, which is where I am currently. So um, I still don't really consider myself a Texan per se, even though I've been here for much, much longer than I was in New Jersey, um, but appreciate many, many things about, uh, about Texas. And um, really, you know, after you know, growing up and all that, all that good stuff and getting into the, getting into the working world, um, started out doing some various marketing related things uh, for different um, you know, small companies, different stuff, you know, writing product descriptions, email, stuff like that. Eventually found my way into where I am now, which is uh, Stud Group. Stud Group started a little over a decade ago by, uh, by two guys. They brought me on as employee number one and really were focused on, like you said, the digital advertising side of things. So that was a time when digital advertising already was very big. But there were many, many businesses who were making that transition from traditional media to digital media, realizing that their customers and potential customers were spending their time online and that they could cost effectively reach them and make money by using digital advertising. And so we came and said, hey, let's figure out how to you know, cost effectively use the platforms that existed, which then you know the big ones are google and meta and still are today obviously it wasn't called meta back then but uh, facebook and then instagram and so forth and um and really you know we figured things out bootstrapped the company um ran our own advertising campaigns get our own clients figured out how to do well for them and then just grew things from there growing the client base growing the team finding other good people to bring on board a talent to add to our team and uh, i took over the ceo role here at stud group about five years ago and continue that that vision and uh, every day is trying to improve the results we're driving for our clients and also improve the, the team that we're building here at Stud Group. Excellent. So where did you meet these two friends that made you employee number one? Like how does the how did that relationship get started? Well, one of them I met the moment I was born, actually, because one was my brother. Uh, my older brother oh. uh, was one of them and then a very long term friend of his. So they started things and um, being being a brother, you know, we had, we'd, we'd worked together already in other places and uh, my brother knew kind of my work ethic and approach to things and uh, gave me the opportunity to come on board. And so that's, that's how I got started. Gotcha. Very cool. So did they, so they might not have had to really do a lot of convincing you <laughs> in order to, to come along and do this, huh? <laughs> not too much. No, it was, it was definitely, um, you know, it was, there was risk involved, um, even more so on their part, certainly as starting the business on my part, but risk, risk all around in basically saying, Hey, we've not done this exact type of thing before. You know, we were all new to digital advertising. They certainly had background in different areas of marketing, but not per se running Google ads and Facebook ads and so forth, but said there's opportunity, uh, there's business opportunity, there's a need in the marketplace and 
we believe we can learn it and help fill that need and really build a business here. And um, yeah, it's been it's been a fun adventure, ups and downs as always in the entrepreneurial journey, but uh, a lot of fun along the way. Absolutely. And what year was this that this got started? That was, um, I think around, it was about 12 years ago, I want to say. So 2012, 2013, I believe. Um, I always get mixed up which year, but somewhere in there. Okay. Excellent. So you were not at the very, very beginning of the whole online space and, and getting into that world, but close enough, especially when uh, the digital side and the advertising really started to started to grow essentially so you in that aspect you were kind of there from the beginning would you say that that's true so there was definitely you know, like you said lots of digital advertising going on before we got into the game i wouldn't say that we were we we're ogs in any way but um it was far less sophisticated than it is these days um far less you know far more little of the wild wild west of just figuring out how to do things what worked what didn't work platforms people could use and um, while it was certainly, there was certainly, you know, competition and plenty of people in the market then, um, again, not, nowhere close to where it is now with the, you know, the saturation of how many people, how many advertisers realize, okay, I'm going to run a business. I have to be on Google uh, because that's where people are, are searching for things, finding the needs and solutions. Or, hey, if I want to push out my message to people, you know, Instagram, Facebook, or other platforms too, like TikTok, LinkedIn, et cetera. These are all vital. And so there was certainly the beginnings of that when we got into the into the game. And that's only continued to escalate since then. And when you came on board, do you remember the first client that you that that came in after you became an employee? That's a fantastic question. I think the very first client that I worked on, if I remember correctly, was a small audio visual firm that was selling um i believe that they went out and you know how people set up events they would you know rent their services and equipment for you know running the cameras and audio geared events things like that i think that was the first first campaign that i worked on personally okay and were you part of the sales process to bring them on board not for that one. Um, not the very beginning. At the very beginning, I started more on the the technical side of things, so executing on the work, uh, figuring out, you know, creating the advertising, creating the campaigns. Um, got into sales. Um, when did I get into sales? Um, at some point um, down the road, as we as we expanded and as my comfort level too with what we were selling increased. Um, but at the very beginning, I was more on the back end. Right. Right. So started started on the back end, got comfortable, and then started getting into the sales pipeline process. So when you started getting into that sales side of things, how would you how would you explain to people what it is that you do and like what the results were that they could have? You know, especially if mm -hmm. they're which I'm sure you encountered this a lot, that they have zero experience with digital advertising or maybe even not believe in it absolutely a lot of the approach that i i generally take is question based it's as much as possible okay understanding where are they coming from um and also you know most of the history of our company inbound sales have been the majority of what we're doing so not cold calling someone and saying hey you should use google ads but using our own advertising our own marketing to reach people who are who are interested it doesn't mean that they're necessarily sold on it, but they're at least interested and curious and reaching out and saying, okay, what can you do for me? And mm -hmm. so it's a very much you know, conversation of, all right, tell me about your business. Tell me about your goals. What are your pain points right now? What are you trying to accomplish? And then identifying what can the advertising platforms that we work with do to accomplish that. And, you know, if we're getting specific numbers like, hey, you know, I can afford to spend X amount to bring on a new customer. Awesome. Well, let's let's kind of work our way back forward from there. And let's say if you can afford to, to spend this much, then let's look at, you know, run some numbers, run some projections. Say, OK, if we could get, you know, realistic conversion rates and these what the cost per clicks are you know, we're looking at right now and, you know, figure out are the platforms a good place for them to be spending their time? Um, or that do they not have the margin and numbers for it? So I, I think, you know, as with all sales, ultimately it's it's what can 
what can we do to meet the needs that are being expressed? And so you got to figure out what those needs are. Sometimes you got to help clients or potential clients understand what those needs are because, you know, as business owners, sometimes we have very much general ideas of what we're trying to accomplish, um, but we need help kind of translating that into more specifics. And um, that's what I think a good salesperson does is helps translate that into specifics and then addresses which of those specifics can be answered by what you're trying to sell. Absolutely. So when you're talking with these clients and figuring out their needs and coming up with an idea or a campaign, are you helping these clients actually design the campaign and the copy and everything else that goes into it? Or is it just, we'll place the ads, we'll make sure they're performing? Yeah, we're very much helping with the, the design and the creation. So generally speaking, what it looks like is, you know, the business comes to us, we talk through things with them, understand their goals and what they're trying to accomplish. And then we go out and execute. We create the advertising, we create the campaigns, we identify the targeting, we decide on the bidding strategies, you know, the, the whole nine yards, we deal with all of that. And our goal and objective is to get the right people to you know, the client's website or to a client's physical location, if it's more of a you know, brick and mortar type of client, and get the right people there in a cost effective way so that when they convert at a realistic conversion rate, our client is able to you know, make a lot more money from them than the money that they're spending in that advertising. Gotcha. So that all being the case, now we're going to kind of flip the script a little bit and grab people's attention. What advertisement campaigns or ideas, and you don't have to name any names, obviously, but that have come across your desk and you're like, man, this just sucks. And why does it suck? Uh, you know, it's funny. The first thing that pops to my head is billboard a specific billboard advertising that i see often so you'll be driving out and you'll see a billboard and it will be kind of the default billboard from the billboard company so they don't have an advertiser right now and so they'll have a message something like you know does advertising work it just did and that i don't know if it's a pet peeve maybe that's too strong to say but the way i look at it is it didn't work unless i take action like yes i saw that message but I'm not the right person to see that message necessarily. I mean, I'm not looking to buy a billboard right now. Advertising doesn't truly work until the business that's doing the advertising is actually making money from that advertising, getting a return, just throwing out impressions into the world, getting eyeballs on things. Those are all vanity metrics. All I care about is how is my bottom line being improved? And so you know, I don't want to, I don't want to speak too harshly on those billboards. It, it, it's creative. It's eye catching. You know, I understand what they're saying. Um, but the performance marketer in me says, no, it didn't work because you don't have money from me yet. And so, <laughs> you know, it just kind of, I don't know. It's the first thing that comes to mind. Yep. That's obviously the goal is we're out here marketing to create sales and sales is the lifeblood of any business. Now, when you're talking with people and you're designing the whole campaign, are you thinking about, um, I'm assuming that you're thinking obviously about the end goal, making that sale, but are there steps in between in this whole outreach campaign that you're designing? So it's not just see the ad and then, Hey, go buy my stuff. Is, are, are you designing certain steps into there? Absolutely. Yeah. There's that you know, idea, obviously the marketing funnel and what that funnel looks like looks different for every business, but ultimately there's generally steps in that funnel. There's a, a customer journey. There are some businesses you know, that are very, very quick demand. It's either, Hey, I get the call and it's going to convert right now or not. So there certainly is that type of business model, but most businesses, there's a process where your potential customer has to think through things. They might be contrasting you against competitors, searching for different things. They might not even be sure that they want to purchase yet what you're selling. And they're just, you know, in the education uh, phase right now. And so you have to think about it as a funnel and you have to think about what can you design as different steps in that funnel that allow you to connect with people, to provide value to them, to make yourself memorable to them, and then work their way down the funnel. 
So that could be anything from, you know, if you're a B2B business, it could be, all right, here's valuable contact context in a blog post first that people are searching for. They see it. Cool. Then next, Hey, we've got this white paper, download it, give us your email address. You get this white paper. Cool. Now we have your email address. Now we're sending out nurture emails, more valuable information. And then every now and then call to action. Hey, you know, sign up for this, this webinar, whatever, and basically working the way down until you've established that relationship and credibility with that lead to the point where they are ready to you know, purchase whatever the product or service is that you're selling. So it's definitely, you know, with many of our clients, it's helping them think through, okay, what does that funnel look like? What are the stages? And then through advertising, how can we get the right message to the right people at the different stages in the funnel? And then how can we track that as they work down their funnel to understand how well is the funnel working and to understand you know, how much can we afford to get someone into step one based upon the conversion rate as people work their way down and what our ultimate goals are for the bottom of that funnel. Excellent. And I figured that would be the answer, but obviously having it detailed out by somebody that's living it you know, every day can be exceedingly helpful, especially if, you know, you as the entrepreneur, maybe like I said at the opening, just dipping your toe into these waters. And that's actually where I wanted to go next is, is let's say that we do have an entrepreneur who's listening to this and they are thinking about, is it time to get into advertising, digital advertising? So that being said, is there a way or a way to look at a business or an ad campaign to decide is Google going to be better or is Meta going to be better? And what makes that distinction? That's a fantastic question. And that's uh, one of the most common questions that we get asked when businesses reach out to us. There's a couple different things that I usually like to recommend in terms of a framework of making that decision. So the first is, are many people actively searching for what you're selling right now? So if you are, you know, let's say you're, you're a plumber, um, people are going to be searching for plumbers near them and Google is probably going to be the best place to be because, you know, you're not really spending time on Facebook. Like, oh yeah, I love that plumbing picture. I'm going to remember that name for the next <laughs> time that my sink breaks. No, it's like, oh great. Right. 2 AM. My sink broke. I'm going to Google and call the first person that comes up. Yep. Um, whereas, you know, if you're a business, let's say you have a SaaS product. And this is you know, a product that solves a lot of needs there in the marketplace, but there's education that needs to take place. People don't even realize that they have these problems necessarily until you point them out. So they're not searching Google for your product or necessarily for solution, you know, for, the, the, for the answers that you provide. And so there you might want to be running ads on Meta, ads on LinkedIn, et cetera, um, po pointing to the right people and saying, hey, you know, do you have this problem or, hey, there's this solution to your problem. Um, so really, whether people are, are searching or not for the solution is one of the biggest things I look at. If they are searching for the solution, generally, I'm going to start businesses on Google because it's you know lower hanging fruit. Those people are lower in the conversion funnel. And I want to tap into that and capture as much of that relevant traffic and turn it into sales as possible. And then generally you do need to expand from there because there's only so many people who are searching for it as a solution. You generally, you know, once you tap out that market, you still want to keep growing as a company, as a business. And so then it's about expanding to more of that push marketing, finding what are the platforms where people who are in my target audience are spending their time. And then what uh, creative, what messaging can I communicate to them on those platforms to interrupt their day in a positive way and to make them interested in my product and maybe get them into my funnel to start working them down towards the bottom of that funnel. Yep. I love, I love it. It's, you make it really simple right at the first. If somebody is searching for it, like that plumber, when your sink breaks at 2 a.m., well, that's, uh, that doesn't need much convincing, <laughs> you know, to buy. Uh, yeah. Whereas, like I said, SaaS, B2B, a coach, you know, you've got some more, you had some more authority and relationship building to do. And that makes, that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. I want to jump into meta first or Facebook as it is known for most people. They have, in my opinion, some of the strictest and most nebulous and you're smiling. I think you know where I'm going. <laughs> Guidelines for creating ads. 
in the industry, as far as I can tell. Yeah. How let's let's just say we're bootstrapping the ads. We're going to get started on our own. We're just going to start running Facebook ads, right? Maybe maybe we'll hire Stub Group down the line once we sell some stuff. But right now, we're just going to do this on our own. How do we stay within those guidelines so that our ads get approved and we can actually start running this thing? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, you're right that their guidelines are, are very ne nebulous, often stringent and frustratingly inconsistent too. So <laughs> you might be yeah. like, well, you know, this ad's been running for, for two weeks and now it's just approved. Why? Or, hey, my competitor's being way more, you know, uh, blatant at something than I am. Why am I getting flagged? And yeah, they're, they're super inconsistent. Um, you know, a few tips that I would give are, um, first of all, read the policies, you know, as nebulous as they are, at least have as much information as you can going into things so that you don't make obvious mistakes that are clearly against their policies, number one. Um, number two, be really careful about asking questions in your ad copy. So if mm. you say something like, um, you know, do you have diabetes or even, you know, are you depressed or whatever the case may be? Facebook is very anti that because that can make, from Facebook's perspective, that can make the person seeing the ad um, feel in a negative manner. And Facebook doesn't want people feeling negatively when they see ads. So rather than saying, you know, um, are you feeling depressed today? You know, here's something to make you feel better. Say, um, you know, make your day better with this. Just don't have the question mark. Just flip it to a statement, not a statement of you are X or are you X, but, you know, feel better with this or whatever. Um, so that's, that's not, uh, you know, a, a kind of not, not secret, uh, by any stretch of imagination, but something a lot of people aren't aware of before they get into things. So just be really careful about asking questions in the ad copy. Um, and if you're in any kind of, a you know, business space where it's a, a sensitive space, you know, healthcare related stuff, um, you know, certain kind of vice related marketing, um, uh, financial related marketing, any of those places where Facebook is particularly paranoid about things, just be, be especially careful with how you craft your messaging. So, you know, not making claims that, mm -hmm. um, certainly not making claims you can't back up. I mean, just nobody should make claims that can't back up, but even if you can back up claims, you still have to be really careful because Facebook often doesn't care if you can back up claims because they're not going to put the time and effort in to actually assess that. They're just going to oh, yeah. say, Oh, you know, that, that's too risky for us. So, you know, be, be careful, um, before and after pictures as well. You generally can't do stuff like that. A lot of what I'm saying is kind of, you know, in the health space, because that's one of the most sensitive spaces that there is on Facebook. Um, but a lot of those ideas can apply to, to pretty much any space that you're operating in. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with me being in the financial world, I've run Facebook ads before. And even I've gotten ads that are, have run before for other, other products, other insurance professionals. And even though they've been tried and tested, still, like, I think two of the th three that I put up got flagged and removed, like, almost instantly. And I'm like, what? I, I, wait a minute. These were supposed to have run, you know, in other versions, obviously. I put my own spin on it. But, uh, it, you know, from other advisors and worked. Like, what the heck is going on right now? Yep. Yeah. It can yeah. Be... You just mind-numbingly frustrating it, it's ridiculous it's ridiculous yep. and if, if you're listening facebook this caused me to stop advertising with you so maybe think about that a little bit more <laughs> you would you would think that it would be in their best interest to help people spend money on their platform <laughs> you, would, you, would you would think, think. <laughs> yeah you know you know what think I, I, it was funny because you said that Facebook doesn't want people to feel negative. And I'm like, have you been on Facebook? There's a lot of negative crap that's on there. But then you made the Very distinction, true. oh, with their ads. Okay, so when it comes to their money that they're getting, they don't want you to feel negative. I get it. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, so, okay. So we know not to ask questions, not to write checks that your body can't cash. Shout out Top Gun. Um, we know that when it comes to Facebook. So let's move over to the other panopticon of Google. Yes. Now, 
we're having more search intent, we're having more uh, conversions, hypothetically, theoretically, hopefully, when we do this, right, using Google. So what are some best practices or tips when we're talking about starting Google ads? Yeah, so for Google ads, um, you know, one thing a lot of people don't realize when they think about Google ads is how many different platforms Google actually owns and can serve ads from. So a lot of people think about you know, Google search as being Google ads, but mm -hmm. also you've got YouTube, which A, massive video platform, and B, second biggest search engine in the world. Um, you have uh, Google's display network, which is many of the ads that you see just as you go around the internet and you see, hey, an image ad pop up over here or a video or whatever, a lot of those are actually served by Google through their network. Um, and then you even have things like uh, Google Discover and the ads you see in Gmail and so forth. But at yeah, the end of the day- super annoying, man. Those yeah. Gmail ads, like yeah. I, you end, cause sure. you end up like clicking on them to just to delete it. And then it opens the ad. I'm like, oh, you son, you got me again. <laughs> Google's really good at uh, capturing those clicks. They, oh my gosh. Got it down. So for most advertisers, you know, when they start with Google, I'm generally going to recommend that they do focus on the search side of things. Um, most of the other platforms I view as expansion opportunities. Some I like better than others. But for most businesses, we're going to start with, again, the, the bottom of the funnel, which is people who are searching for what you provide. And that's going to be Google search campaigns um, or if it's an e-commerce business that's selling products through their website. It could also be Google shopping campaigns, which are the, the ads that come up with, you know, images of products and prices and so forth when you search for a product on Google. Mm. So generally, I'm going to start them with those types of campaigns. And um, as far as, you know, tips and how you set up, so a couple of tactical things. First of all, when you create search campaigns, you create keywords that you are targeting. So again, that plumber, you know, plumber near me, emergency plumber, et cetera. You're going to figure out what are the types of things that you want your ads to serve for when people search those phrases in Google. And Google gives you different options when you select those. You can do what's called broad match, phrase match, or exact match. And basically the idea here is how much flexibility are you giving to Google when they match different synonyms and variations of terms to the keywords you've defined. And if you go with broad match, um, there's a lot of, again, we'll use flexibility. Flexibility is as maybe a generous term here, but you may find a lot of terms are matching to your keywords that you don't actually want to match, that, you, that are not really as relevant as Google maybe thinks they are. So for, for brand new advertisers, I always encourage, uh, be very cautious about using broad match. Um, I generally tend more to say, hey, use phrase, use exact match. Now, there's exceptions to every rule. And often as we scale accounts, we do get into broad match once we've given some good data to Google for them to figure out what is or isn't relevant. But mm. especially early out, and if you're doing it yourself, and so you're already, you know, maybe not using all of the, the shortcuts that someone like an agency like Stub Group knows what to do to try and you know, minimize the learning time. Um, be really careful about broad match keywords. You can waste money really, really quickly. And I would also say um, a lot of newer advertisers put so much focus on the campaign side of things that they forget about where on their website they're sending people to and what that Ooh. experience looks like. Good so they spend point. hours, what's the perfect ad? What's the right keywords? What, you know, what bidding strategy should I use? And all that's important and great and good. But then you just send people to your homepage that doesn't have a good call to action, has all sorts of distractions. Um, you're you're hamstringing yourself because yeah. you know the the ad is just the first part. It's what gets people to your website. Then that's where they actually decide whether or not to take action. So put yourself in the shoes and mindset of the people that you want clicking to your website, and look at your landing pages and your website as such, and say, am I clearly saying what I sell? why they should trust me, what are my credibility elements, do I have testimonials, you know, do I have a clear call to action of here's the next step to take, whether it's pick up the phone and call me, fill out a form, whatever it is, um, that's a really crucial aspect of running profitable campaigns. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you brought that up because that is, that's something that was just drilled into me by you know the mentors and people that I've worked with in the past. Yeah, you wanna make sure that your advertisement connects directly to um, your landing page. Or even if it's not a landing page, the, the page that has to deal with the, the subject of the ad. Because like you said, put yourself in the mindset of the person that clicked, right? 
they click on the ad talking about, you know, the best shampoo ever. And then they land on your homepage and it's just talking about the litany of personal care products that you offer. Like, well, that's not what I wanted. Right. I wanted the best shampoo ever. Why am I looking at all this mess? Bye. You know, and it's, it happens just that quick. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. We've got some Google tips. We've got some Facebook tips. So let's talk about, let's talk about stub group a little bit. So who is the type of client that is ideal for stub group? Yeah, we work with a, a wide variety of different types of businesses. So, you know, some, some agencies in the ad space will focus on a particular niche and say, hey, we're the agency for dentists or HVAC or whatever. Um, we've mm -hmm. decided for different reasons to be more diversified. Um, and so we work with everything from e-commerce businesses to lead generation, you know, local, national, big, small. Um, what I would say is a pattern across them is, first of all, being very performance focused. So most of the clients that we work with, going back to what we talked about earlier when you're with the billboard, it's not about how many eyeballs can I get on my ads, um, how many impressions can I get, et cetera. It's, hey, we have very clear actions that we're trying to drive from our advertising. We have ROI goals we're trying to hit, cost per lead goals, et cetera. And so very performance oriented. And so we spend a lot of time on the tracking side of things with our clients so that we can have as good an understanding as possible for what are the results that we're driving from our campaigns and uh, which parts of the campaigns are driving those results, which ones aren't, so that we can always be optimizing and improving over time. So you know, performance oriented is a common, common uh, pattern. Um, and then I would say most of a lot of the businesses that we work with, you know, they're definitely small to medium sized businesses. Um, we do some work in the, the larger side, enterprise side of things, but not a lot of enterprise. Mostly we're talking about small to medium sized businesses where we are working directly with either the, the owner of the company or, you know, a, a marketing manager type of position. Those are, are generally who we're working with. And so they are obviously very, very invested in their business and also understand a lot about their business. And so the type of client that we're seeking is the type of client who is looking for a partnership with an agency. We don't want to just be, you know, button clickers where they say, okay, go do this and report back. Um, obviously, there, that there is an aspect of what we do, but we really approach things in a consultative way as well. Going back to again, where we, you know, when I said, "Hey, we ask questions when people come in during the sales process," we keep doing that as our clients of ours because we want to understand what makes them different from their competition. What are the unique value propositions they have? What are the best-selling products or services they have? And how can we you know, work with them to help understand those things and then find the places from an advertising perspective where we can make their dollar go the furthest and say, you know what? You've got the same widget as 100 other people over here. Let's not focus your ad dollars in advertising that. Let's focus on this thing over here where you've you know, developed some, a unique skill set and you're one of five people that's really, really good at this in the world. And let's go advertise that and again, make your dollars go further. So it's a little bit of a roundabout answer to your question, but you know, ultimately it's, um, it's less about the type of business, I would say, and more about the mindset of the business that we're ideally looking for when we're looking to partner with new clients. Okay. All right. And I like that you use that term partnership. Um, so when we're thinking about that, is there different revenue models that you guys have that way uh, maybe you actually do partner? Like you become like a revenue sharer of the companies that you help along and maybe it decreases prices for them on the front end. And then you've got just a straight up, you know, this is our fee to help you get this done. Is there anything like that with your company? It's a great question. So generally the way we structure things with clients is based upon how much advertising spend we're managing for them. So we'll take a, a percentage generally of what we're, we're you know, spending for them. So it's not directly performance oriented as far as it's not revenue share. It's mm -hmm. frankly, it's really difficult to structure revenue share things because just from a reporting standpoint, it's incredibly hard. And then there's from when we've tried it with clients, there's just so many variables to play into things that we found that a much more kind of clear signal of how happy and healthy a client is, is how much are they willing to invest into ad spend? So if we're not doing a good job for a client, 
they're not spending more money. They're spending less money or we're not working with them at all anymore. Whereas if we're driving good results for a client and there's opportunity to keep improving upon that and scaling that with more ad spend, then they're happy to spend more. And then we make more money as well. So our incentives are aligned in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you know, you'll have a client or a lead say, well, our incentives aren't really aligned because you make more money you know, when we spend more money, regardless of, of whether or not we're successful. But my answer to that is always, you know, if, if we're looking at this for like, you know, a relationship of one month, sure, you could say that. But the only way the clients are profitable to us is when we have long term relationships with them. And I'm never going to be like, OK, yeah, let's make an extra thousand dollars this month by spending more money for them. that's not working. Um, if that's going to you know, end the relationship and they cancel next month because we're not making money, I want to steward their money effectively, do a fantastic job for them and have them as a client. 12 months from now, 24 months from now. And that's where the money truly comes for us as an agency. So that's, that's how we think about it and how we believe that our incentives are aligned with our clients through that kind of a structure. No, that makes perfect sense. It's the same thing. If you're working with a financial advisor and securities, you know, if you invest more money and they grow your money, well, then that's a good relationship and you'll probably keep that advisor, right? And they obviously make a, a percentage every year on the amount that you have invested with them. So it's that whole saying, if uh, you do better, then we do better. Exactly. Yep. 100%. Absolutely. So speaking of the clients at Stub Group, I was wondering who in your mind would be a great success story that we could kind of get into a little bit and how it was such a success? Oh, that's a great question. Again, lots of, lots of names come to mind. Um, one that comes to mind, I can't, I can't say the name for privacy reasons, but sure. we're in a client of ours for I believe since 2016 is when we started working together. So 2024 now it's about, about eight years. And um, you know, when they started with us, they were already a good company. They were, they were doing well, but you know, young, small. Uh, the the owners were the salespeople. They were the ones on the phones when people were coming in calling, and uh, they're in the the B two B, primarily the B two B space. A little bit of B two C, but mostly B two B space. And we've uh, worked with them again since 2016, and have just seen incredible growth in their business, um, which has has definitely been con contributed to by the advertising that we've done. We can't take all the credit for it, obviously, but you know, they're spending, um, these days are spending about a hundred thousand dollars or more a month in advertising. Um, and they've grown to where they're one of the, uh, one of the fastest growing companies on the Inc 5,000 list. And, you know, we've seen them grow from again, their, their owners being the one picking up the phone for customer service calls to now having, you know, whole organization with sales teams, with their owners, you know, definitely not still picking up the phone, so forth and so on. But it's just been really cool to see how they've grown. Um, and yet also to see how they've been very, very focused on still the quality of their service and product over that time. They're a company, they manufacture everything in the US. They're very, very careful and thoughtful about even everything down to the customer service people, um, where they hire them from, how they integrate them into their team. And so they've just been a, an awesome client, again, to, to partner with um, to help see tremendous growth come partly from the advertising we've done for them. And then also just see them make really smart business decisions about how they grow their team and how they provide their products and uh, and just see, you know, see see their growth again, getting to that spot on the Inc. 5000 and just, you know, seeing how their revenue has grown year over year has been a lot of fun to watch. So when they first came to you, were they running ads at all? That's a great question. I am trying to remember. Um, I can't remember for sure if they were running any ads or not, but I know if it was any ads, it was minimal. Uh, definitely, we, we were, you know, small, small budget, small ad spend back then. I think that we started their advertising, uh, but I, it's been long enough. I can't 100% recall. Do you remember what, uh, like, what was the catalyst that made, that made their advertising go from, you know, let's say they're pulling in, 50,000 a month and it just catapults it to a hundred thousand a month, things like that. I mean that the ad spend that they're doing with you now is just, to me, it's just almost inconceivable. Um, but I know obviously it's all about scale, so I'm not going to get into some kind of lack mentality about that. 
but still it's an impressive number. So do you remember what that catalyst was? It kind of like, oh, we now we got this thing figured out and look what happened. So most of it comes down to the quality of their product and what okay. they're selling. So they just have a really good quality product that is dependable and that is needed by people. And so what we're able to do um, is it's not the most you know glamorous advertising out there either. We're not talking about, you know, TV spots for Taco Bell. We're talking about, <laughs> all right, they have a great solution and we just need to find the people who are searching for that solution, find them at the right time in the journey and make sure that we're getting them again to the right messaging on the client's website and helping them with that messaging and tweaking and testing different things so that the um, the dependability of their product is effectively communicated through the advertising. And then when someone picks up the phone to make that call, again, that great customer service team and sales team is, is kind of closing that deal and bringing things to fruition. And so we certainly as Stubgroup can't take all the credit for, you know, for, for most of that. Um, because they have a great product, great team in place, and we're able to then build upon that and say, all right, let's go out and find the right people. And again, do it in the, in the cost effective way. So identify these types of searches, these types of people, they are not converting, they're not turning into profitable customers. Let's not spend advertising dollars on those. These over here, this is our sweet spot. This is what's working. And then let's you know scale that over time to make sure that we're reaching as many of those people who are searching for that product or who need that product as possible. Perfect. So when you say, when you said searching, it, it reminded me of, of another question that I had, I actually had forgotten about um, going back to the concept of the solopreneur, somebody just getting started with ads. You mentioned keywords before and searching for the right keywords to, to utilize. And as somebody that has obviously delved into ads before, I understand the whole keyword thing and how and looking for them but it, i also know it can get very uh confusing and search intensive sometimes as somebody that's living this business day in day out do you have some a uh, tool or like a website that people can go to that you know maybe is free or whatever that can uh, help figure out a keyword and if it's going to work or not yeah i can definitely definitely give some shortcuts point them in the right direction so um, let's talk Google first. So Google has what's called Google Keyword Planner, which is a, a tool within the Google Ads platform. When you create an account, it's a free tool where you can both get ideas of keywords. You can say, okay, now here's here's some example keywords. Give me other ideas similar to this. And you can also see how much, roughly, how much in search volume there is for different keywords. It's not exact numbers, but Google kind of, kind of benchmarks them. So you can say, okay, this one gets a lot more than this one, et cetera. Um, and then you can also get a, a sense for how expensive those keywords are. Um, I put sense a little bit in air quotes because Google Keyword Planner is notoriously off <laughs> when in terms of saying here's exactly what it's going to cost. But at least you can get some ranges. You know, if it says, okay, the cost per click for this one is 20 bucks, this one's five bucks, you might not, those might not be actual raw numbers you end up paying, but you know, this one's probably a lot more expensive than that one. So it can give you signals. Um, so that, that's a helpful tool. Um, other tools, there are third-party tools as well. So things like uh, spyfoo.com, semrush.com, where you can do keyword research as well as look at competitors and see what keywords does it look like competitors are targeting to get you, you know, a leg up of, hey, if competitors are going after these keywords, it means they've probably done some testing already and figured out somewhat what works and what doesn't. So I can learn from that and go after these as well. Um, and then also if, when you're just trying to come up with ideas and think through different ways that people might refer to the, the problems that you're trying to solve, um, LLMs like chat GPT are, are really helpful. So just, Hey, you know, what are, what are 20 keywords someone might use to, to search for this? You'll often get ideas that you might not think of, uh, mm. without that. Um, and I guess lastly, I would say to just, just going and Googling and seeing what comes up in the autocomplete what comes up in the related searches down at the bottom of the page is it really helpful to just see all right what are how are people referring to things and i'll often get ideas from that that i didn't immediately think about when i started the keyword research process yeah that last one is that last one's really good because yeah the the 
how did what did you say it was like the not the related searches but the the one the, before uh the autocomplete yeah where auto you start typing something yes. and then it's like do you mean to say this and then that tells you oh a lot of people are saying that so that's probably a keyword that's relevant right right yeah that's a that's a great one and like you said it's it's free it's readily available everybody knows how to use it or how to be able to see it so that is awesome very awesome well guys i mean this I, I told you this episode has so much value so many nuggets in there little tips and tricks and hints to help get your ads going or optimize them and obviously if you need to hire someone, Stub Group is the group. I mean, come on. You've heard everything that John has to say here, his knowledge, his experience, taking clients from spending $10,000 a month to $100,000 a month plus on ads. You can't do that unless you do a good job. So John, where can people find you, get into your world, and, and just see if they're going to be a good fit for your services? Yeah, I'll give you two places to go. So in both of these, we'll have some some free content as well as you um, as you think you know think through this journey and whether you might want a higher step group. So the first one, go to stepgroup.com/free. We've got some some different guides on there. Some related to like Google compliance. Some we're adding just tips on running profitable campaigns. Um, so some cool stuff you can download there. And obviously you can see more information about Stub Group as well. And then also check out our YouTube channel. Uh, just search Stub Group on YouTube. We put out quite a few videos. Again, lots of free content, a lot of it around Google ads and meta ads and just how to use them effectively. And uh, hopefully that will be helpful to uh, to those watching and listening to this. Yeah, and I've, I've already seen a few of those YouTube videos and they are very well done lots of great information. So yeah, guys, go check that out. The links are going to be below. And John, I just can't thank you enough for this conversation, man. I know it's going to help a lot of people. Really appreciate it. Brian, thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, guys, well, you know what to do. Like the show, share the show with your friends, your entrepreneur buddies. You never know what just a simple free share can do and help people in your network. And Peace. We'll see you in the next one.